Today, we're gonna to talk about VO2 max versus FTP. If one's going up, why doesn't the other necessarily go up and down? And we're gonna cover all that. It's gonna be an interesting discussion. We're also gonna talk about pro race strategies because we have two pro racers with us here. We have Ventum Bikes, IV Audrain. And then we also have Hannah Otto, DT Swiss, Pivot. It's good to have you, Hannah. Uh, before we get into anything, and Chad, uh, welcome, Chad. Uh, as always, good to have you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Chad's not pro. Chad and I are not pro over here. So, uh, but Hannah, I want to kick things off first with you. You've recently started your season. So, for those that don't know and are just listening to the podcast, Hannah is uh, a you race mountain bikes, gravel. And you race in the World Cup circuit, but you also race like Lifetime Grand Prix. And if you watch uh, uh, Call of a Lifetime, that whole thing, you'll see Hannah's featured prominently. She won Leadville last year. Awesome stuff. But you started your season with XCO and short track racing in Puerto Rico this weekend, or last week, I should say, last two weeks. Uh, in Salinas, you got second in short track and third in XCO. And in Rincón, you got fourth in XCO. So I want to talk about what you learned over that process. Cause first race of the season, this is a common thing for a lot of people listening to this right now. Like you're, you've been training, you're maybe getting into those C or B races. You're probably not getting into an A race. Uh, and sometimes it can be jarring when you come into a race and like something it's like, wow, it's really hard or wow. I didn't realize that I was going to be this fast, vice versa. What did you learn from those races? Yeah, I think you nailed it right off the bat, which is the first race of the season can be really stressful. And I think that's actually counterintuitive because they should actually be the least stressful because it's an opportunity to try things out, to see where you're at. Um, there are B and C races. They're usually ideally not a races. And so I think a lot of the time people get really hung up, um, that those first races of the season are almost these testers. Like, is it going to be a good season or not? And, I have definitely fallen into that in the past, but I think with maturity and experience, I've very much learned that that's not the case. And so this was a really exciting chance for me to come to these races and to focus on process goals. Um, and that really was sort of my mantra this week. And that was across several avenues. Um, so for example, I did new pre-race openers, uh, new warm up. Those are things that I Ooh, practiced. What was the yeah. structure? Yeah. That's super interesting yeah. to people. Cause everyone always like, I don't know about you, Chad, but I've like had races that have gone really well and I'm like best warm up ever. And then I do that same warm up in another race and it goes terribly. Whoops. Uh, you know, yeah, exactly. Whoops. Uh, so what's, what's the warm up, warm up structure? Yeah. So I actually cut down my warm up a lot. I used to warm up for 30 ish minutes. And especially given how hot this race was going to be, I decided first right off the bat, I'm going to cut it down. And then I also in the off season was really reflecting on a lot of things from last year, thinking about things I can change, thinking about things I can do better. And it occurred to me that the way I'm warming up for my workouts was not at all the way I was warming up for my race. The way I was warming up for my race was so much harder. I was putting in a lot more effort than I was before my workouts. And it really hit me of, well, they should honestly be pretty similar. Cause if I feel ready going into workouts, why would that not be the case going into a race? And upon self-evaluation, to be totally honest, I think some of it is when you head into a race, you want to test your legs. You get mm -hmm. so excited and you add effort after effort after effort thinking, Oh, I wonder how I feel if I do this. I wonder how I feel if I do this. And it occurred to me that I was also doing that in my openers. I was using my openers as a chance to quote unquote, see how I would feel the next day. Mm. Um, and that's just not a great system, at least not for me. And so I cut things back in a way that not only do I feel like it was effective for me, but it also the way I was doing it, um, I very intentionally made it. So I felt like I didn't know how I felt. Uh, because I wanted, it, it doesn't matter how you feel in warm up or how you feel in pre-race is not necessarily going to change the outcome of the event. So I would rather not know for me personally. And so I structured my warm up in a way where, yes, I hit all of the energy systems, but I didn't feel like I was doing a test of the legs before the race. The race is that test for me. Chad, I want your thoughts on this. And then Ivy too. Um, what, what comes to your mind when you're listening to this? 
right now I'm baffled by the fact that we haven't made this realization sooner. That <clears throat> we haven't either had Hannah on the show athletes, talk about right? it. Like all we of as us athletes. Trainer yeah. Road offering advice to the many people who have asked us, how should I work or warm up for this particular race? And we always we always have, I think, good answers, but we could just as easily have said, well, pick the workout that's most similar to your race. How do you warm up for that? Because it should carry. And if it doesn't, well, uh, th then it gets a little complicated because I don't want to recommend people start tweaking their workout warmups, but it should shed some insight into what they might need different from their workout warmup to their race warmup. Mm. Yeah. Ivy, what comes to your mind? Oh, just what you said about one workout or sorry, warm up working really well one day and then <laughs> working really poorly the next day really resonated with me, <laughs> especially because, um, so much of my work life training balance varies how I feel so much day to day that I tried so hard for a long time to push this one warm up, And I was like, this is the warm up, This is the one. And ultimately the number of matches I had each day just varied so much that I, uh, would end up burning too much in this warm up, thinking that it would get me over to the other side and prepare me better. And I just had to muscle through it and it would be okay. And that wasn't the case. Um, mm. so I don't know if that resonates with any of you all, but yeah. Uh, yeah. there wasn't, there wasn't a like one size fits all warm up for me for every race, for every workout. And I really have to, for myself kind of monitor what that's like daily. Um, and it helps me better mm -hmm. pre prepare for the intervals I'm about to do in the event I'm about to do, you know? Ditto, and I think that uh, for me, yeah, yeah, I think that flexibility is just so important because if you feel the need to muscle through the warm up. Mm. Whether you like it or not, you're probably going to be mentally thinking, oh my gosh, this is so hard. What am I going to do in the race? Um, versus you could simply just alter that warm up and go to the start line feeling confident and ready and excited. And I can almost guarantee you that that mental outlook is going to be better than whatever warm up your legs may have gotten from muscling through it. There's a interesting concept you spoke about, of about trying to reach a conclusion about how the race is going to go from the warm up, uh, And I think that, so we've talked a lot on this podcast about approaching racing with curiosity and seeing how you can do rather than coming in and, and with like clear limitations, definitions in a box that you get to stay within. And I can't help but think that it's likely or, or, or quite possible that athletes are instantly nullifying the opportunity to approach a race with curiosity by looking at the results of a warm up or sensations during a warm up to define how the race will go. It'd yeah, be very forming, difficult to manage. They're forming that. expectations based on minimal information. And again, uh -huh. this this goes to back to when I said expectations are damning because curiosity is basically the antithesis to expectations. You're entering it into it with an open mind, come what may. I'm just going to see how it goes. I'm curious. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's uh, maybe it's a bit different at like the highest level, especially in some sort of sports that are you know, or some sort of cycling disciplines that are very like measured, where it's like it's a 40 kTT, right, Chad? And in a 40 kTT, you kind of like even if your power does vary a bit, you know, roughly the range that you're going to be able to hold. And it's, and it's kind of like predetermined, but when we're talking about pack racing and that sort of stuff, that's really truly so much of it out of our control. It's so beneficial to approach it with curiosity and for word, you know, it's worth saying that absolutely in a time trial context too, it's worth approaching with curiosity. Just, you know, don't embrace that curiosity maybe with, you know, 50 Watts over your goal right out of the gate or something. But yeah. And I think, you know. I think that curiosity helps us remain free of judgment too, because when I think mm -hmm. expectations are basically judgment in advance of whatever the thing is, you're already deciding if it goes this way, it's good. If it goes that way, it's bad. But if you just enter into it curiously, it's, it's neither of those things. You just take it as it comes. The, I, my, I've vacillated over the years between like, you know, very structured warm ups. At first, it was just like, I don't know, I guess I warm, I, you warm up before a race. Like, I had no clue. Uh, and then going to the point where I wanted to make it extremely structured and something repeatable uh, to something that's less structured. And now I just have typically found that in, for me, riding and like you said, doing something similar to like a warm up that I would do but riding for, uh, and knowing when I feel warmed up, I can tell when I feel warmed up. And 
definitely not going too hard. I'm thinking of a video that I just saw last weekend, I think of Luca Schwartzbauer. He's the rider for the Canyon uh, team, just a short track beast. And his warm up before a short track, I thought he was going to rip the cranks off of his bike and like the rollers he was on were going to shatter. Like it was insane. And who am I to, to judge there? Because obviously that guy's an animal with short track and is able to manage it. Some people go really hard. I do notice that it's very popular with juniors to like spin really fast and go really hard with warm ups, and even more in the cross country Olympic kind of zone. People really go hard in their warm ups, and you know, depending on what you're doing, it's worth experimenting with beforehand. And I really like that principle of aren't you warmed up when you train? Uh, so why not do something like that? Good call. Yeah, uh, and I think also another thing to point out um, is. One of the reasons it's hard for me to make changes like this is because I always have this thought of, well, if I change what I'm doing, does that mean what I was doing before was wrong? And that's a mm -hmm. difficult thing to swallow. I don't want to admit I was wrong, um, but I don't think that's what it means. I think we're constantly changing and evolving and different athletes and different demands and different abilities. And so if you're listening to this and that's a hesitation you're having, it doesn't mean what you're doing is wrong. It just means it might be time for a change. It's a really advice. good call. Yeah. Uh, one thing I forgot to say, sorry, Hannah, before you continue on to the rest of the learnings, I pulled, we, we went down a, 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 an alley here with this one, but you're also, uh, sponsored by competitive cyclists. And that's like a new thing this year, uh, which is super exciting too. So there, I know that the competitive cyclist folks, a lot of them listen to this podcast. So glad to hear, uh, that they're supporting you. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, they're what awesome. else did you learn Hannah from this? Yeah. Um, so I think the other, you know, other process goals I was really focusing on was my nutrition during the race. I think in XCO a lot of the time, because it feels so short in comparison to some of the other races I do, it's something I can sort of throw out the window a little bit. And so I focused on that a lot more, um, focused on drinking more. I focused on drinking mix, um, also sponsored by first endurance this year. So making sure that I consume mix during the race and also a gel. Um, and then I think another really big thing that this weekend was for was taking risks and trying different strategic moves. And that was definitely something new for me. I think because I allowed myself this curiosity going into these races and didn't just see it as, you know, the stress of where am I at this early in the season? I actually opened my mind to this is a chance to try other things. I know that I'm fit. I know that I'm strong. So let's see what happens if I do this and let's see what happens if I do that. And I had very exper different experiences in all of the races. Um, in the XCC finishing second, I feel like I was really focusing on being patient. Um, mm. Ultimately, I you know, it was a sprint finish and I feel like I waited too long. Um, mm. and then in the next race, I was really motivated by the start and wanted to get ahead early. So I attacked really hard off the gun and ultimately the heat just caused a major implosion <laughs> for me. Um, and then that fourth, that fourth place in Rincon, I had a little bit more of a difficult start and it was a little difficult to pass and get around people. And what's funny is at this point in the season, I actually think that my best performance was that fourth place finish. Um, and when it comes to nationals and things like that, the finish is really, really important. Um, that is what I'm going to look at when it comes to nationals and world cups and things like, and lifetime grand prix, et cetera, et cetera. But at this point in the season, it wasn't about the placing. It was about walking away and seeing what I could take away from it. And I was able to take away a lot of things from that fourth, um, including like, I think the other things you can look at are the things that I've worked on in the off season really hard. Did I feel improvements in those specific areas? So something I worked on a lot was technical skills. And I felt like that was a major improvement for me. Um, and then looking at the opposite is it's so early in the season. You probably haven't done a, maybe a ton of specificity. Maybe you haven't done a ton of VO2. And are those things that you haven't done yet indeed your limiters? Or are you limited mm -hmm. in other areas? And I felt really strongly that when, you know, after the race, when I spoke with my coach on the phone, like, hey, the things that I was missing are the things we haven't done yet. And so that's really exciting going into the rest of the season as well. 
I've got a handful of questions and if anybody else has some, of course, jump in too. Um, but first of all, you mentioned that you were taking in mix and I believe a gel as well for a cross country Mm -hmm. Olympic style race. How many carbs per hour roughly did you take in? Do you know, or for the race did you take in? Um, it can be a little hard with the mix because I'm drinking and dropping, but Mm -hmm. I would guess it was probably around, let's see, probably around 90. 90, which yeah. it's, um, it's kind of funny, right? Like in the, the tradition, traditionally with XCO, a lot of athletes are like, oh, it's so short. Like you don't need to take in a lot of carbohydrate, but man, if you think about it, it's like, it's like when you turn on a faucet, you're turning on that carb faucet full blast in terms of draining it into your muscles and your muscles using it. You know, you're just, it, cause it's so intense. It's just high, like a very glycolytic effort the entire time. So mm-hmm. makes sense. Was that hard to get used to, or did you do that in training beforehand? Uh, did it mess up your gut at all? It didn't mess up my gut, but because I did it in training beforehand, mm-hmm. um, I've actually mix has often been something that's been hard for me to take in. And for a long time, I was just like, this isn't something that works for me, but yeah. I pushed it and pushed it and pushed it. And I've actually found now that when I reach for my bottle, I'm wanting it to be mix, um, versus in the past, it was like, oh, I wish I just had water. Um, <laughs> but I've trained myself to the point where my body is excited to take in that mix. So I think that's a really cool thing as well. What did, what did you take in, in terms of like the mix and the gel and stuff? What, what product were you taking in? Um, the mix was the first endurance sour watermelon. And then the, the gel was the first endurance berry liquid shot. Cool. Awesome. Uh, and then the other, th- you mentioned that you were, you were patient in the short track. Mm-hmm. What sort of things were you tempted to do that you said no to because you were being patient? Yeah. Um, so the short track, I felt really great. And it felt like, honestly, you know, those races where you're just like, man, are we even going hard? That was really <laughs> how it felt. And I was looking down at my power and I was like, man, I guess we're going pretty hard, but it feels it's a good feeling. Easy. Yeah, it's <laughs> the best feeling, right? Um, and so, you know, there were a couple of times th- we had a group of maybe four people um, throughout most of the race. And there were a couple of times I was really tempted to do an attack to bring it down to two of us. Cause I was pretty convinced that I could make it a one-on-one situation, but I, I wanted to remain patient because if I made that attack, it was very likely that I was attacking and guaranteeing second rather mm-hmm. than attacking for the win, um, which is what I wanted to do. And so I remained patient in that scenario. And then Uh, when I remained too patient was I, it was, um, sort of a climb and then a descent and the climb was very mellow, but it was mostly single track. And I thought at the top of the climb, it opened up to double track for about 10 seconds before it entered the descent. And I thought I'm going to just, that's my attack. I have to enter to the descent first. I'm going to sprint around right before that descent. Um, and Alas, 10 seconds is not that long when you're both going all out on the final lap. And so (laughs) I should have made my move before that final climb, which essentially means you would lead for the whole entire last lap, um, Mm. which seems like a long move. But I think given this course, that was that was the move. It's always tricky to to be patient, but then also um like take advantage of opportunity, right. That, that comes up. I've, that's something I've struggled with in races. Like I kind of like enter a mindset and it can put me in a rut rather and, and close off my vision to other opportunities. And it's really helpful to like step back and have like an external perspective as you're going through that race, you know, to, to keep yourself in check with it. Cool. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, yeah, tons thank of good you. stuff. Uh, and then Ivy, you raced, uh, your gravel, your, we can't say your gravel career is starting because you <laughs> have done other gravel races, but you're doing more gravel this year than you have in the past. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're just getting started with training and everything else this year. Um, you were in Arizona, so you went up to BWR Scottsdale, uh, mm-hmm. Belgium off ride Scottsdale. You did the wafer. Did you see podcast listeners out there? I did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> For sure. Did. Yeah. Lots it was of, great. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Uh, yeah. what was it like? Cause this is your first time on your Ventum gravel bike in, mm-hmm. in a race like this. So it's like totally different. We're talking like carbon, even arrow, uh, gravel stuff. 
Yeah, uh, I feel what, like I was on a rocket you... ship. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> I bet. What were what were your learnings from it? Were you just going out to to put in miles um, and and do so yeah. like with a race, or did you have other uh, outcomes you were looking for? Yeah, I mean, I chose to do the wafer because, um, I mean, I haven't been training that long this year, and this would have for sure been and ended up being the longest ride of the year for me. This is how it goes. That's okay, but I, you know, I knew we can do. As endurance athletes, like, sure, I could do the full waffle, 120, 130 miles. Like, you can do anything if you eat enough and do it right. But, like, (laughs) at what cost? You know? (laughs) Like, I was done with the wafer, the 80-mile one, and, like, was like, yeah, feel great. Let's drive back to Tucson and had a bunch of energy and had fun and felt like I could go harder at moments because I didn't have to pace it quite so conservatively. Um, So I'm glad I chose to do the wafer. It was really fun. But I did learn a lot. I, when we talk about approaching races with curiosity, I approach it with too much curiosity and I was way too chill about it. (laughs) And (laughs) the, they started the waffle riders first and then the wafer riders 10 minutes later. And, um, yeah, I was just way too chill about it. I was like, yeah, well, you know, start, start at the back. I don't really care. Like we're just going to ride. It's going to be fine. But I didn't consider how much single track descending there was, Mm. uh, not super quickly, but that I would, I didn't consider that I'd have to be kind of moving through a lot of course traffic, um, which is totally fine. And I didn't mind doing, um, but it just would have been more enjoyable. I think to have had a clear shot at some of that stuff because, um, for whatever reason I was, uh, just kind of bombing yesterday. Or wait, so on Sunday, on the race day, I was just like really bombing the descents. I don't know if it's a new bike. Meaning or, you're feeling good. On yeah, I was feeling really good. Yeah. And I was riding with people that um, have been riding with me for years and years and that had said like, I've never seen you descend, ride this well, descend this fast. And I was like, yeah, that's great. Um, so it makes, <laughs> me, I, it makes me be like, man, I should have started near the front so that I wouldn't have to, because that was ultimately like a big thing that we experienced in the day was kind of having to really like stop in single track and wait. And oh my gosh, it felt so bad. People had crashed and it was pretty, um, it wasn't gnarly single track, but there were some, uh, kind of demanding sections. You had to just focus all the time. You had to pay attention all the time. And I can see how if you got tired or just weren't used to that kind of cognitive demand when you're riding and descending, how that would be, you can make a mistake really easily. And the mistakes were kind of high consequence when you're talking about like big rain ruts and, um, I don't know. So there were like some crash people and you just had to really like stop on some descents sometimes. And, um, I was feeling for those people cause it was a long day for them with lots of single track. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, I kind of forgot about, um, how hard it is to eat on, uh, descents like that. And, didn't do great with nutrition. Um, I would end up having to, instead of, um, kind of space out my calorie intake, I found myself pretty often, uh, eating like a whole bunch of food in one Mm go, um, on any of the flat or chill sections. Um, but I've got a pretty tough stomach and that was fine, but just didn't, uh, didn't work out great for longevity and being able to feel good for the whole day. I had a lot of like ups and downs because of that, um, in terms of how I was feeling and how much power I could put down and everything. But overall fun event, I guess I'm a gravel nice. racer now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, what tires did you run on that course? That was like a, a hotly debated topic. Uh, I ran one. IRC Bokens and they were perfect. Um, what's really Forties, sorry. Um, cool. <laughs> and approaching with too much curiosity, I forgot to pump up my tires before the race. <laughs> and I started rolling, and I was like, "Well, feels all right. We'll see how it goes." And it turned out to be just right. <laughs> I yeah, did that the other. I did that the other day on my TT bike. I went out for a ride, and I was like. I rolled down out of my driveway and instantly noticed. I was like, "Ooh, I didn't pump up my tires," and I was like. They feel kind of good. Yep. <laughs> and, I, and I ran it and they were, they were squishy and man, it felt so much better on that thing. Cause they're so uncomfortable. Those bikes, you know, they just, oh, yeah, every but... bit of every bump they transfer through. So yeah, I think I'm going to have to talk to the folks at envy. I think actually they have a chart so I can just do that. But 
because I have empties nice. on there and I've got to see like what the ideal pressure is. Maybe it's running less. Um, I want to run yeah. as little as possible because it's going to make it more comfortable. So I'm, yeah. I'm on, I'm on team. Don't pump and just roll, uh, Ivy. So it's a good thing that I'm relaxed about that kind of stuff yeah. because I know many <laughs> bike racers that that would have like wrecked their entire day, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the tire pressure seemed to be good. And I know tire pressure, or sorry, tire, uh, tread was a big point of discussion, but it's not like, uh, on that kind of kitty litter kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, you just can't like create more traction. There's just like a speed limit and, um, just a certain point at which you can, uh, really grip to that kind of surface. And it doesn't seem like tread makes a huge difference, like, uh, to a, to a degree, like you can't be on slicks and feel great, obviously, but, um, yeah, it's not like more tread creates more, uh, more grip on a surface like that. So I think I made the right choice and it was my first time really, really riding, uh, gravel wheels. I was on EC Easton EC 90 AX gravel, like gravel specific wheels. Like I, I really get it actually. Like I had, I had just been riding, um, more like the wheels that were more like cross specific, um, just a little bit different shape. And I really get why gravel specific stuff feels so good. Um, mm -hmm. probably contributed why, to why I was descending so well. Um, yeah. Makes a difference for sure. I'm looking at and that tire right now and it has like pronounced side knobs. And when you're mm -hmm. in terrain, that's unpredictable like that, like the kitty litter or loose over hard sort of situation. That's like the main thing that you want is you want prominent side knobs. And in an ideal world, there's like a gap between that and the knobs. Um, so if mm -hmm. you're going from the center and you're looking out, there's like space in between it and the shoulder knobs. And what that does is that usually makes it so that you have a more predictable lock in that you can have so that if your bike does slip, you're caught by that, that gap into the knobs and it makes those knobs really bite in and puts a lot of, um, pressure on those, on those knobs and they're, uh, biting into the dirt. So that's why like, you'll see in some cases when the dirt's really like, it's not unpredictable and it's really grippy. Um, it's better to have a tire that doesn't have those big prominent side knobs. Uh, but then when you are dealing with the situation where you're drifty all over the place, you want one that has those prominent side knobs for that very reason. So, and that's exactly how they worked. Like there were many, many moments where, you know, you feel like you kind of want to test the speed limit and mm. to be able to like <laughs> lose traction a little bit and feel like you can catch it right away is a really cool feeling. And like, it's like, oh, that's what these tires are made for. It's pretty great. Yeah. It's like you can find the limits and then it gives you a little bit of insurance beyond that. So then that mm -hmm. way you can actually feel comfortable finding them. Cool. Good stuff. Yeah. And how did you carry all of your nutrition and hydration? I'm always curious about that <laughs> in gravel races. Did you stop in food zones? <laughs> oh yeah. I was snacking. Yeah. No, it's, I was way too chill about this. Um, I, <laughs> and I wanted to, it was so cold when we started and I know if I was racing, I would be like, doesn't matter who cares, like just be cold, just be uncomfortable, but I don't want to be uncomfortable. I'm just doing this for a bike ride. So I had leg warmers and like extra warm hand up gloves and, uh, jackets and like a neck buff, everything. And then I was like, at the first aid station, I'm gonna, uh, oh, and I have, I make these like packable musettes and packed it on my bike. Like it just tucks under your saddle. And like at the first aid station, just fully sat down and took everything off and was chilling and <laughs> talking to podcast fans and just stashed it in along a fence and then came and picked it up after the race. <laughs> yeah. So I, so that said, yeah, I, I didn't pack, um, a lot of nutrition because I was not stressed about stopping and chilling at the aid stations. Yeah. Nice. Did you just eat what they had or did you have a crew with your food? I, I just ate what they had. I did bring, um, a few gels and blocks that I knew I liked. Um, I didn't bring any, I think that's something I would change in the future is I would bring like single servings of drink mix that I know I like. Um, I feel so bad. I don't want to like criticize event promoters and seem ungrateful that they had drink mix there, but whatever drink mix they had just like did not, I just wasn't feeling it. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it didn't, I have a pretty tough stomach. So when something makes me feel like a little uneasy in the stomach, I'm like, Oh, it must be giving other people a hard time too. If it's making me feel a little off. So I would have, uh, I would do that in the future. I would have packed like single servings of drink mix. Um, yeah. I don't know if I would ever 
take gravel racing seriously enough to uh, have someone support me. I would just feel bad. Oh, it's like, going to hey, happen. Go, go stand in the desert for six hours and give me snacks. I don't, I would feel so bad. <laughs> Chad and I will crew for you at Leadville, right, Chad? Oh my <laughs> We'll God. do that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ivy, you want to do Leadville? <laughs> nope, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, good man. stuff. Wait, well, how cool. many hours uh, would it take? How many hours does Leadville take? Uh... Oh, you, you'd be somewhere around eight to eight to nine ish. Probably. Nope. Sorry. There. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, like if four you do. hours is preferred, like first four hours, yeah. Like, yeah, I could do this all day. And then like <laughs> hour five, I was like, nope, I'm done. <laughs> so. Well, if you do it, I'm committing Chad, uh, to Chad and I will travel to Colorado oh, and we'll, we'll be your crew. So <laughs> sure. just know that. Yeah, okay. sure. Chad and I have a great track record actually of crewing at Leadville. We, you mm. know, supported Nate and then gave him a really hot giant oh, yeah. bag of margin, <laughs> uh, which made him like completely fall into pieces on power line. So totally accidental. Uh, <laughs> great track record, right, Chad? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I really for anybody trust listening, you guys you want to Chad and I. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, you don't want us. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, but then Chad supported me thereafter, actually, when I was at Leadville, and Chad did a much better job. So it's probably just me, actually. Um, Chad I'll take the fall. Fireball, probably. Oh, I did get fireball. Someone did give me fireball. Really? Yeah, it wasn't. <laughs> did they it mention it was for cramps? <laughs> <laughs> like we covered on the podcast? It wasn't an official aid station either. It's just a, a random homie on the side of the road giving out fireballs, having a great time. And <laughs> just a local do gooder. <laughs> so happy. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Good stuff. <laughs> Well, let's get into David's question. He says, speaking of, al- or speaking of Leadville and altitude, uh, I've been using trainer row for four years now and absolutely love it. I physically see fitness gains. If I stay on, uh, stay on a consistent training plan. Yeah. You and me both, David, that's the key, uh, being consistent. I've listened and good job on that. Uh, I've listened to every episode of the podcast and can't get enough of it. My question is you always talk about elevation training, the effects of altitude, but haven't touched on the benefits of living at high altitude. My hometown and where I currently live and train it at is Leadville, Colorado. I'm currently 145 pounds with an FTP of 217. Do I get the same effects of having a higher FTP if I race at lower elevations? And when he's talking about same effects, we've talked about this on the podcast in the sense that if you go down to a lower elevation, your, your effective FTP has increased, right? Because you can produce more power, uh, more readily available oxygen allows that to happen. So, uh, back to David's question, uh, do I get the same effects of having a higher FTP if I race at lower elevations or would it have negative effects because my body is not used to having a higher oxygen saturation? Any insight into this would be great. Five stars. I love having the best coach out there. Trainer road. Oh, hearts to you, David. Uh, that's mm-hmm. fantastic. Uh, Chad, uh, what, what say you on this? One? I actually see some studies on here that I recognize by the way, which is cool. Huh? Uh, I see cool. some of the ones you've referenced. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go kind of deep on this one. So <clears throat> cool. just bear with that. It, it, it's a, uh, I get a little all over the place, so it's not just a single topic droning on for 30 minutes. And before you so, go into this, sorry, Chad, but I want to mm-hmm. give some context so everybody can understand uh, our situations here. Um, uh, Ivy, you live in Montana, typically, is like your home base for training. Uh, stuff, but my stuff is there. I mean, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> these days, <laughs> stuff looks here. Yeah. You're rambling, you're all over. Uh, um, where, what's your typical training elevation in Montana, though? Uh, I think Missoula, the city itself is between three and a half and four, maybe, and so goes thousand feet one, and goes up from there. Okay. So one to 1300 meters. So 1000 mm-hmm. to 1300 meters, somewhere around there. Right. And then Hannah, for you, your typical training elevation? I live at 5,000 feet and then train up from there. So usually between five and 8,000 feet. Okay. So, uh, that's going to make me do harder math, but I think that that's somewhere around 2000 meters is like, Ugh. like 1700 up to 2020. I could be wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chad, how about you? Well, I was in Reno, which is 5,000, but for the last couple of years I've been in Spokane and I think it's like 1800, but we live pretty high in town. So maybe tack on a couple hundred feet, but real close to 2000. Got it. It's cool. So low. So uh, yeah. And then, uh, Reno here. So 4,500 feet and everything is up from there. Um, so actually really similar to Hannah in that regard. So, uh, so those are our contexts. I just wanted to get that out of the way, Chad. So then people can understand, um, yeah, any perfect. sort of 
anecdote that's shared from us as we go throughout this. Yeah. We'll actually kind of put those into perspective in a bit here too. Cool. Awesome. Carry on, Chad. Okay. So back to David. Uh, uh, I'd never really considered the effects of long-term exposure to high altitude. So first off, I just kind of want to thank you for providing an excuse to delve into what turned out to be pretty interesting in, in a lot more ways than I expected. Before we get to my learnings, though, I kind of, I do want to explicitly address David's question. So first, your physiology at altitude is the same at low altitude. And when I say altitude, I, I mean high altitude. The the mitochondria you've cultivated at altitude are the same ones you're going to have at sea level. Same goes for your muscle capillarization, your aerobic enzymes, uh, geez, glucose, lactate transporters, et cetera. The point is, is that your physiology is the same in the short term. You stay there long enough, things start to change, you know, things start to acclimatize. But in the short term, and, and traveling to a race would be a good example of this, your exposure to more oxygen-rich environments can certainly result in greater aerobic capacity. It's just more oxygen. So, and, and they've done, it was a while ago, like 2000, so roughly 20 years ago. And I'm sure they've replicated, almost sure they've replicated these experiments since then, but they would hyperperfuse, you know, basically saturate or hyperoxically saturate small muscles. And they did specify small muscles, so it makes me wonder if this carries to large muscles, but I can't see why it wouldn't. And this led to very high oxygen-consuming capacities. So alongside your existing aerobic capabilities, this should logically and often does lead to an increased overall work capacity. More work's performed, more watts are generated, potentially less anaerobic reliance, meaning more sparing of those vital stores, etc. So it, it sounds generally beneficial and it does sound, and, and, and we've seen it bear out that you'll, you're going to eke out more power when the, the air is more oxygen rich. My, my concern, and I kind of peeked forward and I saw that Hannah has a really interesting one as well, but mine is, is with your ability to actually stimulate adaptation when you're training in these hypoxic, you know, opposite of hyperoxic environments. Because for sure, you, you get more EPO production, more red blood cell production. Consequently, you improve your oxygen carrying and delivery capacities, but perhaps to, to a less aerobically robust engine, if you see what I'm saying. So the question is, do these benefits outweigh or weight against, I guess, that limitation? Wash. And, and really, I could only guess. And, and if I had to guess, I'd say no, because... To me, this smacks of prioritizing a marginal gain far above a more substantial and yet to be realized gain in, in, in the terms of actually developing what should support the things you marginally facilitate. So a simpler way of saying that is that the lower hanging fruit is pretty much dying on the vine. So flip your, flip your priorities. And, and, and I don't want to imply that this is what David's after. I mean, we'll acknowledge right now this isn't his aim. He simply lives high. So I do want to talk specifically about his altitude, but also what takes place at different altitudes. Yeah. And this kind of brings us to the question of just how high is high. And we could ask how long is long, you know, how long is your exposure to altitude? Because there is a difference if you're a high altitude native, if you've been living at high altitude for a handful of years, a handful of decades, but it gets super complex, super fast. So we're going to kind of table the duration variable today and just focus on how high is high. And within the research literature, high seems to start around 5,000 feet, which is roughly 1,500 meters. And this is where, according to the Institute for Altitude Medicine in Telluride, Colorado, the difference in oxygen density brings about a change in your breathing rate. And for what it's worth, um, and this is an old statistic, but in 2013, this accounted for about 400 million people. So people at high altitude, above 5,000 feet, is hardly a narrow subset of folks. When it comes to optimal altitude, this falls at moderate altitudes of about 6,000 to 7,000 feet. And we've talked about this before. And that translates to about 1,800 to 2,100 meters. And this is where most of the conditioning benefit occurs. And it's due, according to the literature, mostly to a more subtle or tolerable or really a less disruptive level of oxygen deprivation. And that's what we're talking about, we're kind of starving ourselves of oxygen. And then for David, being a bit above 10,000 feet, which is a bit above 3,000 meters, that puts him at what's termed a, a high or very high altitude. And as a result, less oxygen density, greater level of hypoxic stress, and well, different degrees of a few of the things we're about to discuss. That's like in, <laughs> 
where maybe 104 mile bike races uh, shouldn't happen <laughs> personally. So yeah, that's, <laughs> Hannah disagrees. That's, that's you guys. <laughs> and it's like, don't remove that race. <laughs> no, it's an amazing race. Uh, it's, it's and anybody that does it or is going for it right now. It's such a cool accomplishment to do. So, yeah. yeah it's interesting when you layer challenge on top of challenge on top of challenge and people still find a way to excel. It's, it's an mm -hmm. exciting thing to see. Absolutely. Okay. So on the positive side of things, and, and I wish it, well, I'll, I'll get to that. I wish it were all positive, but it's actually quite a lot on the not so positive side. First off, living at high altitude is associated with longer life expectancy, uh, lower mortality for some of the most common diseases, including certainly not limited to cardiovascular disease, stroke, certain cancer, cancers. Uh, and then high altitude living is also associated with lower body weights. But anytime I come across this particular finding, uh, I, it has me scratching my head because what does that mean? Does that mean people are leaner and more athletic and fitter and more health conscious? Or does it mean they're eating less, they're emaciated and dying a bit more quickly than the rest of us? Because it, it doesn't ever really spell that out. Just just says a, a lighter crowd, basically. I would and love to see it normalized to height as well, um, because if you think of the, you know, the, the vast majority of the populations that we're talking about that live at high elevation, uh, you know, thinking of countries like Bolivia, for example, that, uh, you know, very densely, like, like huge cities like La Paz. And then we have in Colombia and Ecuador, big cities. And then, of course, when you go over and we have Nepal and everything else. They're also not particularly tall uh, in, in compared to that as well. So I'm wondering if mm -hmm. that's normalized to height. I, I don't mm -hmm. know. And are, are they typically leaner people over there? S oh, smaller no in stature in general? Smaller in height. Uh, that is like a generality, at least that's measured across those sort of populations. Yeah. But, well, yeah. I, I think what troubles me most is that it, it has been demonstrated that hypoxia actually increases leptin, you know, the hormone leptin, which is our satiety hormone, and that hypoxia often causes loss of appetite. So I do wonder if they're just not malnourished is a strong word, but maybe they're subtly malnourished. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But- Let's table the, the lower body weight enthusiasm for now and, and just talk the, the, the benefits are outweighed when it, when it comes to those with existing uh, respiratory conditions. So, so anything that you could get from living at altitude, should you have respiratory issues coming into it, some form of COPD, where the effects of altitude frequently exacerbate these conditions, I'm guessing a move to higher altitude is pretty unadvisable. And this does help me segue into, I guess, that the not so positive side of things. I don't want to paint this as a negative side of things. Some of it is downright negative, but I'd rather look at it as just not as positive as, as the other things. And though I really wanted to explore only the benefits of, of, of living high, it did strike me as a bit lopsided, maybe a bit irresponsible to paint an incomplete picture. Uh, so it, or perhaps I just went down the wrong rabbit hole because one paper seemed to lead me to another paper seemed to lead me to another paper and not a lot of them had a, a lot of good things to say. <laughs> Regardless, first area of concern for as altitude high residents is, uh, and I linked to a few papers here, but I, I read a, a handful of them, but the three most pivotal, I think, but first of which was 2013 Zhang, I'm going to guess. And it's a paper on short and long-term effects of high altitude, which just translates to hypoxic environments, not just, but basically, on a neurobehavioral, on neurobehavioral function. So, for example, it's, it's neurological behaviors like language expression, uh, motor skills, memory, things of that nature. And what they observe is that high altitude or hypoxic exposure can damage these and similar functions. What's more, long-term exposure seems to result in more severe deficits. So... Over time, it kind of stacks up. And there was also some evidence, this study is also linked, of neurocognitive effects of long-term high-altitude exposure. And pretty simply in that study, it just pointed out that you can experience some unfavorable changes in your voluntary attention processing. To put it another way, it sounds like a slight attentional disorder. And these get even more pronounced under higher perceptual loads. So if you're already a bit fried, a bit overstretched for whatever reason, high-altitude conditions may not be of great benefit over the long term to your ability to maintain attention. Let then, no level racers just don't listen to this whole section. <laughs> yeah, well, these, that, that's short term exposure though. So this is definitely yeah. different. Although in the short term, you have your own set of challenges. And then there uh, also, also some attention deficit related evidence exists that uh, long term exposure to high altitude affects conflict control in the conflict resolving stage. And that is the title mm. of the paper. So, so it doesn't leave much to the imagination, but I should mention this was a comparison of lowlanders versus lowlanders who have lived at high altitude for the past three years. 
And suffice it to say, long-term exposure to, again, high altitude, hypoxia may delay your ability to figure your way out of conflicts. But, <clears throat> excuse me, there's no evidence here that suggests that this delay impacts behavior. Rather, you're just going to struggle a bit more with the kind of the comprehension of the situation. doesn't mean you'll act differently. So most of this kind of sucks, but, but there's more. And, and um, that, that's basically the psychological side. So let's look briefly at the physiological side. The physiological effects of this long-term high-altitude hypoxic exposure, starting with pulmonary hypertension, which doesn't sound promising. And, and, and all this is really is increased blood pressure in the arteries, so the vessels carrying the oxygenated blood of the lungs. So we're basically talking about high blood pressure in the lungs. And this particular side effect of long-term altitude exposure is perhaps most threatening in its slow onset. So it's kind of like metabolic disorders and similar slow developing pathologies, things that come on so gradually as not to be noticed. You just, you just it's, it's just like a, looking at yourself in the mirror every day. You don't notice little changes that someone who hasn't seen you in a couple of years will notice. And it, so, so it tends to evolve really gradually, as you might expect, considering we're talking about morphological or, or structural changes in the blood vessels themselves. But years of exposure to, to high altitude can lead to less than favorable, favorable effects on your lungs, blood supply, basically, your, your pulmonary circulation, stress on the heart. But that said, and in the interest of not being alarmist, the uh, American Lung Association noted that in the United States, only between 500 to 1,000 new cases per year are being diagnosed. So maybe, I don't know if that qualifies as rare, but it's not uh, super, of super high prevalence. And then rarer still, but I feel worth mentioning, is the possibility of high altitude pulmonary edema. So HAPE, let's just call it HAPE, because it's a lot easier to, to say during exits and re-entry from or to your high altitude home. So, so fluid in the lungs is something that usually occurs as a result of rapid changes in the barometric pressure, but it can also occur in residents of high altitude locales such that it's actually achieved its own class of HAPE titled HARPE. So it's high altitude resident pulmonary edema. So what's, what once had been misdiagnosed with some frequency as, as asthma or pneumonia is now vetted via the use of pulse oximeters and, and if necessary, chest x-rays to reveal that you don't even have to face a change in barometric pressure to experience some of the, the, the hardships of, of altitude sickness. So no change in altitude or location, you still get hit with some of the nasty effects of altitude sickness. But on the lighter side, I should mention that high altitude pulmonary edema, HAPE, is easily addressed or reversed via more oxygen. And, and there's a lot of ways to supplement oxygen, one of which is via an oxygen concentrator used during sleep. And this brings me to my final, not so positive, but not totally negative consideration. Sleeping at altitude effectively piles on to the other challenges of reduced oxygen density. And if you think about it, we're already experiencing low blood oxygen saturation when we're breathing normally at these higher, higher altitudes. So what happens when sleep brings with it its lower breathing rate, its shallower breaths, well, just what you would have guessed, even lower levels of oxygen in the blood potentially fatally low in folks with existing respiratory illnesses. But even for concerned healthy individuals, I don't think it's the worst idea to have a pulse oximeter handy. I mean, things cost like 20 bucks, if for nothing more than peace of mind, but also because it could forewarn illness, whether you know mild or severe. And, mm -hmm. and truly, finally, for anyone who suffers from sleep apnea, these uh, aforementioned effects of sustained hypoxia ought to be on your radar more so the higher you live. And I say this having seen a finding stating, and I'll quote, central sleep, uh, actually in the quote for a second, central sleep apnea is, is the brain regulated version of sleep apnea. So it's not the more, the, the far more common obstructive version where something's physically in the way of the airway. Mm -hmm. Rather, this is kind of a brain malfunction that, that causes, causes the apnea. So back to the quote, central sleep apnea due to high altitude periodic breathing apnea affects about a quarter of people who ascend to 2,500 meters, which is roughly 8,200 feet, and almost 100% of those who ascend to 4,000 meters, which is 13,000 feet or higher. So the wow. point here is simply that the higher you go, the heftier the toll of altitude, at least with respect to sleep apnea, but demonstrably other effects as well. So there, there really seems to be, as you might expect, a point of diminishing performance and adaptation returns, and it looks like the same goes for health benefits. 
So this, looking at this in the context of an athlete that's living at Leadville, doing all of this and kind of wrapping back to your initial point, Chad, you're kind of like, um, making this point that like you training at altitude, you know, it isn't the ideal condition to train, to increase, you know, your, your, your output and, and, and abilities as an endurance athlete. Um, it's simply not like the ideal circumstance for it, right? Far, far from the ideal to the point where I wonder how anyone actually gets strong living at Leadville without supplemental oxygen. I don't know. I don't know how they can get enough outside of anaerobic resources to provide a stimulus for their, uh, all this aerobic adaptation that they need to be faster mm. in Leadville, for instance. What are, I mean, just like as a basic recap, then what are the benefits of living up there? Because there's this, there's this mindset I mean, we hear it in cycling commentary, you know, Nairo Quintana, it's like he, you know, grew up at altitude and as a result, that's why he has X sort of advantage. Is there, did you find any evidence to show that people that lived at altitude therefore have some sort of like for, for a significant period of time, therefore have an advantage, a performance advantage? Uh, Cause we, the only- we know about training camps, right? Short mm-hmm. two week sort of things. And where you're just trying to increase the red blood cell response. Yeah, and, and what do they typically you know, you do at training camps, that. but live high and train low. So they're still, they're, they're, they're chasing the appropriate stimulus and then subjecting themselves to that further stressor while they sleep and, and convalesce. So as far as general health, there, there was some encouraging stuff in terms of uh, Highlander natives and, you know, obviously greater red blood cell counts and, and EPO, but I, man, if I'm not mistaken, I think those things even normalize, but it's outside of our context anyway, because we want to know, does it improve performance? And I don't think, again, the benefits that you get from living at altitude and also having to train at altitude wash. I think you're still taking a bigger hit to more important adaptations by, by living up there and training insufficiently than if you could just spend time there, but train in a more oxygen rich environment. Yeah, it makes sense to me. And, and when you get down to that oxygen rich environment, right, Hannah, it can actually kind of be problematic. Uh, you feel like it's almost like you find a new gear on <laughs> and you're just like, wow, this is cool. And you're eager to use it, but then that can put you in a world of hurt too. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that this athlete, for example, if they're living in Leadville and then they go to a race at sea level or even not at sea level, even at mm-hmm. in Salt Lake, 5,000 feet lower, um, their numbers will likely look higher on their computer. It's going to feel like they gained gained something, you know, Mm -hmm. um, if he, if they're looking at 217, all of a sudden they might be seeing 240, something around there. Um, it could be like 15 all the way down to sea level. It could be 15 to 20% that you could, in terms of performance improvement that you could expect Mm -hmm. a huge change. Imagine getting that overnight. Yeah. But one of the problems with that is your body isn't used to doing that. Uh, so the muscular load that it takes to push that wattage isn't something that, this individual is going to be accustomed to. And so even though their cardiovascular system or um, uh, their oxygen saturation is allowing them to do that, it doesn't mean their muscles are prepared to do that. And so Mm. it can result in greater fatigue, not being able to hold that wattage the whole race or training. Um, Mm. Also training at that high of altitude, things like VO2 work, it's just really, really hard. Um, because you can't hit that high of numbers and you're kind of capped out. And so your ability to work those systems to their maximum ability is extremely limited. And then on top of that, your ability to recover from them is even more limited. So you're never going to be able to do the amount of load that you would be able to do at a lower elevation. Therefore, you're leaving something on the table in terms of your ability to reach your maximum um, potential. And poor David in this situation, it's not an easy trip down to Leadville with I seven or down to Denver with I 70 to, you know, it's not like, it's not a quick little drive down to go train down low and then just go back home to sleep. Uh, it's, it's more complicated than that. Um, and and this is, uh, but at the same time, David, there, there are some benefits that you have, for example, on race day at Leadville, you're used to the feelings that you have there. You aren't approaching the race with fear and with a perspective of limitation. You're, you're quite familiar with that. And on a day that long, at something like Leadville, that's quite advantageous. 
Um, there's a lot of like psychological harm that a lot of athletes do to themselves, like sabotage. Uh, what I mean there is coming into a race. So like it's at altitude, I'm going to blow apart to pieces when they're not used to it. So you don't have to worry about that. There's that, that, and that, and that is, that's a benefit that can actually be quite substantial because athletes that are already setting themselves up for failure like that, maybe talking about a DNF, like not even finishing. Whereas you like, that's simply just not even something you'd think of because it's a normal circumstance. You know what that makes me wonder too, is I wonder if it's as much a shock to his system, to David's system when he ascends from, cause it goes up to what, about 14,000 feet? 13,000 something, right? Anna? Okay. Call so, it's like so, 13, eight or 13. It's really, yeah. Okay. So let's call it roughly 14,000. <laughs> yeah. So he's going yeah. from 10,000 to, <clears throat> to roughly 14,000, which is a 5,000 foot or a 4,000 foot gain at already high altitude. I wonder how that compares to like living in Reno and going up to top of rows or something where we rise. Uh, what is that? Two, 3,000 mm-hmm. feet. If, Four to 5,000 if you go all the way up to like the towers and stuff. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 So we, yeah. we have an opportunity or you guys have the opportunity to get way up there. I, I wonder if it scales is, is what I'm asking. It's a great, that's a great point. Uh, David, yeah. you should let us know how terrible a Columbine feels and then we'll measure the terrible compared to other people's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> Not sure yeah, how we I mean, do it effectively. Live in Reno and you go up to the top of rows or you go up to the towers and you, you experience that very substantial gain in, in, in out, or elevation. Yeah. I never really struggle with that. And I don't, I don't recall anyone I trained with struggling with that either. Yeah. You notice that you notice the difference, but it's not like yeah. a struggle, right? It doesn't it's seem not like, mm-hmm. right. Exactly. You know, this is, there's a, and we just had a, a fantastic podcast, science of getting faster podcast episode, um, with Sarah, where she talked to researchers all about altitude and how, why it doesn't make you faster. So go listen to that episode. It's the science of getting faster podcast. You can find it on whatever podcast app you listen to. You can find it on YouTube. It's fantastic. Um, I had, so recently I've been watching some pro racing and man, uh, we're not going to get to too many questions this week, but I'm glad uh, that this is like, no, I was just thinking, I was stuff. like, what? Talked about my dumb growl race for way too long. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. People enjoy hearing about that, Ivy. Uh, it's when I talk about my races that people are like, enough, like move on. So, um, uh, with, um, okay, so so we had Remco of do do very well at the UAE tour and win. Um, and his coaching staff said that he was then going to altitude. I wonder, cause we've talked about this before. I've done a YouTube video on this, where we talk about live high, train low and the studies that exist on this. And the fact that in most cases, altitude camps are really difficult to actually get the desired outcome from, for an average person, you need to have circumstances just perfectly aligned to be able to get the sort of impact that you want, that positive impact. Um, and it's likely, or it's, it's, um, it's likely that that's going to be unrealistic for most people. Pro athletes are a bit different. We have Matthew Vanderpool in his camp talking about how last year his performance at the Tour de France, possibly the reason for that was an altitude camp prior to the tour. And if you look at it, it seems like, bear with me and I'm making an assumption, but it seems like what a lot of pro teams are doing and staff coaching staff is let's say that an athlete after, after a block of racing needs to just ride easy for a little bit and recover because they've been doing really hard stuff. It seems like what they do is they think, well, why not get a little bit of an advantage with that by having them ride easy and recover at altitude? Because that's what they do when they're at altitude camps. Anyway, they aren't riding hard when they're up at altitude, but go to altitude so they can ride easy and recover. But then we can make sure that we're just boosting red blood cells. So then when they come back down, it's like a little extra bump. And I think that the risk that you run with that is that if the athlete truly needs recovery, you're just making that recovery more difficult to achieve. However, if the athlete isn't to the point where they desperately need that recovery, but it is going to be beneficial, they're thinking that it might be, you know, the juice is worth the squeeze in that regard. And looking back, and I even looked back just at like, you know, team staff announcements and altitude camps for a lot of different athletes, it seems like that's the common pattern. When it's like an athlete needs to recover after a block of training or racing, they will recover at high altitude. And when I say recover, they're still doing low intensity work up at altitude. Um, but that's a really risky game to play. Um, because you know, as we see, uh, sometimes it backfires and the athletes come back from that even more fatigued, uh, that job was not accomplished. And then you find yourself in a hole. So man, altitude's really tricky. Um, and I don't really know. I want more because Keegan, for example, is just a staunch, like, you know, love altitude. He spends 
a good half of his year up at altitude in Utah training um, from like 5,000 feet uh, and up. And he's like, Oh no, it gives me my turbo. It's like, you know, it's what I need. It's like the extra little uh, bit on top. And I'd be really curious if indeed that is the case or if I, you know, cause in my mind, he'd be faster if he was training at lower elevation, I would think year round. And then, you know, it, able to, if he's able to sleep high in one regard or another, maybe use that, but can't help but think that just training at altitude just really isn't beneficial for athletes when on a long-term basis like that. One thing so. I do really like about living at altitude is the fact that as a mountain biker, a lot of my races take place at altitude. Mm -hmm. And so it just, for me, at least it takes away some of that stress of when should I get there? How should I acclimate? Just all of those questions. And for someone who's traveling so much already to know that, okay, I'm not going to have to travel there to acclimate ahead of time. I'm already set. That takes a little bit of stress off my plate. That's a really good point too, because then that stress just adds further layers uh, to everything. Right. Um, yeah, I could see that. Um, all right. This next one from Blake, this is going to be a good one. This is like the, the headline of the podcast. Why does my VO2 max not increase with FTP? That's basically what's being asked. Blake says, I live in Sydney, Australia and where I am has lots of rolling Hills with very little flat parts. Because of this, I started using trainer road around six months ago to supplement my outdoor training. And I mainly use the train now feature. Good to hear, uh, Blake. And if you're listening to this and you haven't used train road yet, go to trainerroad.com, check it out, sign up. Uh, so far my FTP has climbed from 190 to 243. That's incredible. Um, 50 Watts. That's so cool. Uh, with a goal of 300 by the end of the year, I'm 75 kilograms with a stocky build from my days playing Australian rules football. Um, I probably should have called that Aussie rules football, I think, and running, uh, during my fittest running days, my VO two max measured by my Garmin watch hovered around 55. And what I'm finding now is that my cycling VO two max hovers between 52 and 55 whilst my FTP continues to rise, uh, measured by AI FTP detection, uh, which is so cool. You don't have to test anymore. Give it a shot. Uh, I no longer run due to hip injuries sustained from my time in the military. My question is why does my VO two max remain constant? Even though my FTP is climbing at a good rate, I'm 35 or 38 years old and love shorter intervals during workouts as long sustained intervals bore me and I lose interest fast. You and me both, uh, Blake, um, that's how it goes, right? Um, okay. So first things first, I want to, there's an assumption that we're operating on that the predicted F or the predicted VO two max from the watch is, is accurate and indicative of true VO two max, right? Um, in this case, that's what Blake is saying. Why does my VO two max remain constant, even though my FTP is climbing at a good rate? It may indeed be the fact that your, your VO, your watch just isn't measuring it or accurate accurately. So keep the grain of salt handy with that. But with that assumption baked in, uh, Chad, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, v, in terms of VO two max, not budging, but FTP increasing. Mm-hmm. You kind of brought this up already, but let's let's reiterate. The, we're going to make the assumption that your Garmin is at least precise. You know, it may not be accurate. It may, it may not be offering a value that's maybe you're 60, maybe you're 45, but at least it it's precise and we can say it's going up or it's going down. So first off, you may simply have improved something we've talked about many times, your fractional utilization of VO2 max, which you know basically you can now work and, and sustain higher percentages of your VO2 max. So, so same VO2 max, but now your FTP resides a little closer to it. That's one possibility, um, pretty, pretty strong possibility of that. Uh, secondly, another theory I'll fling out there is your efficiency is tanking during your workouts. So as, as fatigue mounts, you're, you'll eventually consume greater, greater oxygen, so greater volume, greater VO2. So you, you become less efficient. You're doing the same work, but you're doing it for a greater oxygen cost. Along those lines, residual fatigue can have a, have a similar effect. I mean, just think of trying to do, if you've ever done a VO2 max test, try, try doing that on tired legs or a tired body. Not only is there likely some central restriction, something, uh, some nervous system brain limitation, but that could also be coupled with some, some muscular limitation, clearly, possibly even some level of nutritional deficit. If you got your, your nutrition wrong and your odds of attaining your VO2 max decline potentially sharply. And, and this is the explanation behind the term VO2 peak in the research literature, because a lot of the times they can't attain that plateau, which delineates 
and VO2 max. So the, the, the way a VO2 max test works is you measure gas exchange, you're measuring oxygen consumption. At some point, when the work goes up, oxygen consumption doesn't rise anymore. So you, you, you've attained a plateau. It doesn't matter how much harder you work, you're not going to consume any more oxygen. That's your VO2 max. But for a lot of reasons, you may not hit that plateau. You may just hit a peak where you can't, can't rise anymore. You're tapped out. A lot of the time, VO2 max, VO2 peak actually do align plenty of the time, as a matter of fact. But they have to, in some cases, just say, this is where you peaked. Maybe your max may not be your max. And, and my point here is, I don't, I don't know how Garmin could possibly account for this, for this decline in efficiency. And it leads me to believe that their estimate is not going to account for this either. And then this, this actually ties into a question that we had weeks ago that I managed to botch, and I've been trying to set the record straight ever since, but it would have required a total non sequitur. I mean, nothing even mildly tangential. I would have just had to Is it insert it into density? something. <laughs> no. Are you I'm just kidding. Sorry. I ain't touching that one. No, that one's <laughs> dead to me. <laughs> Screw <laughs> it. Okay. So let, let, me, let me set the stage first and, and continue to answer the question. First off, changes in your submaximal oxygen consumption, your VO2, are largely attrib attributable to peripheral changes. So peripheral meaning muscular in this case. So m mitochondria themselves, the, the number of your mitochondria, their size, their function, their related enzymes, and of course, things like increased capillarization and better blood flow to the muscle bed, et cetera. Whereas changes in VO2 max itself are largely central in nature. And, and I don't know if this is, it was contentious in 2000, 2010. I don't know if it's so contentious now. And frankly, I don't have the energy to, to look into it and I'm not sure it, <laughs> it matters. Uh, but the, the, these are central adaptations. So chiefly having to do with increased cardiac output, you know, how much, how much blood can your heart push out, but also to, you know, how well do your lungs saturate your blood with oxygen? How well does that blood carry the oxygen to your muscles? So these, these are, are our central adaptations. So when asked weeks ago, if, and I can't remember if it was cross country skiing or just some other form of whole body exercise, could that improve my VO2 max on the bike? And I, I just couldn't wrap my head around it at the time, even though I had just said central adaptations <laughs> are what bring about changes in VO2 max. It, it's, I'm a little ashamed of it, but the correct <laughs> answer at the time was it can improve VO2 max for anything. I mean, more oxygen is being delivered thanks to these central adaptations, you know, once those adaptations have set in, and then you can kind of steer that increased incoming oxygen to the muscles that, that, you, that you focus on, ho hoping to increase their peripheral capabilities. So you got the, the central changes. Now you have to adapt or, or again, steer those central changes to the peripheral muscles that you want to affect. More oxygen coming in. Now I need to make those muscles a little better at the things that they do to make use of that, thus addressing the, the specificity necessary to make you faster specifically on the bike. Hmm. So that aside, or, or that covered, let's get back to my overlapping point, which is that you may have approved, improved your ability to operate at a higher percentage of your VO2 max, that fractional utilization we just talked about, but maybe mostly via these peripheral or muscular changes. And you've either topped out your VO2 max, you know, hit that genetic uh, roof, I guess it'd be, maybe. Far more likely is you haven't stressed your heart, your lungs, your vascular system sufficiently, either recently or maybe never at all. I don't know how new you are to structured training, interval training, et cetera, but that's exactly what you need to do now. You need to grow your VO2 max, take a break from, from, from growing that or, or create more room in your VO2 max, take a break from growing your fractional utilization, get back to further increases in your FTP, which uh, I, I would bet are on the table. And then a quick set of reminders how to do this pick a direction or, or pick a method. There are so many ways we, this is another recurrent theme here is long, slow distance LSD training. That'll work. That'll increase your aerobic capacity or it can high intensity interval training, you know, things like VO two max repeats, anaerobic short shorts, um, sprint intensity training, 30 second, all out efforts. All these things can improve your VO two max. And why might that be? Look at each of those and you can see exactly what they're stressing of those things I just talked about. Is it your blood? Is it your lungs? Is it your heart? And yes, even tempo, sweet spot, threshold work, the more moderate intensity training zones can also raise your, two, your, your VO2 max, all to varying degrees based on a number of things uh, or any combination of these things. For one, your physiology, you know, what works well for you may not work well for others and vice versa. What works well for others may not be your cup of tea, may not bring about adaptation. 
or perhaps your level of conditioning because elite level riders have to grow increasingly selective with how they pursue particular forms of further adaptation. They've already brought themselves to a point. Now, how do I, how do I push it a bit or a lot? Sell them on the table, but a lot further. Or even your level of adaptation to a particular form of training stress. And Hannah or Jonathan, you touched on this earlier. For instance, it, have you gotten really good at sweet spot work? Well, probably time to try something new. Are you a rider accumulating 30 plus hours a week in zone two and you've plateaued? Well, time to change the stress. So the, the take home message Yikes. is <laughs> it may in fact have changed or increased but, but, but Garmin just failed you. And if it hasn't, well, now you know what you need to do. Uh, have you, I'm curious, um, Hannah, have you had your VO2 max test and do you remember like what the numbers are and have you seen that fluctuate over time? Um, I had it tested in college um, and the number was 79. Um, and were and you, uh, you were a triathlete at that point too. So were you running when you got this test or was this a cycling test? It was a cycling test and it was actually in the middle of cyclocross season. Um, so were you pretty so think, fit at that time? Yeah. So Sorry. I think it was a good Sorry. time to have that tested. Um, and, and honestly, I haven't tested since. And the reason for that is I just don't think that that number matters that much. It's a really nice number. It's a pretty number. It feels good. Um, for some of us, it, for, for yeah, you, Hannah, it feels yeah. great. For, <laughs> um, <laughs> for those of us that don't have 79, not so great. <laughs> and, and ever since reading this question, I've been trying to put this into words because it's not, it's not that that number is unimportant. It's just not how I would measure my cycling fitness. Um, I think the that wattage is really the representation of our ability to execute on the bike. VO2 is, while it's a representation of fitness, it lacks many things that we need in order to be a successful bike racer. And so if I were to pick a, a high VO2 number or high power numbers. As a cyclist, it has to be power numbers. And so for this individual to be concerned about their VO2 number, um, for all of the reasons that Chad has mentioned, it's good to acknowledge it. But if you are seeing an increase in your power across your entire power curve, I wouldn't spend too much energy on it because you're clearly on a good trajectory. Well said. It's, it's, it's my view that all it does is provide a potential. It shows you what your yes. potential is because in Hannah's 79 case, what if she were on the couch? She just had a, a genetically very high VO2 max. It doesn't mean she's going to perform well. It doesn't mean she's operating at a high percentage of that, that her fractional utilization to use a, that term again is, is high. So it's, it says that she can she has the necessary tools to become a very good endurance athlete or at least one crucial tool doesn't say she's going to perform well, but when we see our power numbers reflected back at us in the situation and we watch our race performance and tie it to those numbers, I mean, we can see, we can see it in workouts. We can see it in uh, just weekend rides. I mean, we get such easily, and, and maybe that's the other criticism with VO2 max, how are you really going to measure that? I mean, you can estimate it with your Garmin watch and that's fraught with, with issues, or you can what go schedule a lab test and, and do a VO2 max test on a regular basis. That's not realistic for most of us. Ivy, have you had yours tested? No. Because you were like collegiate volleyball and then went into cycling thereafter. Um, and so yeah. they probably didn't have that. But I mean, I've never, uh, I didn't start as an endurance athlete, right? Mm -hmm. And right. Uh, have struggled with that my entire cycling career. <laughs> like wasn't, maybe wasn't meant to, um, yeah, be a, be a bike racer actually. So that's like not something that, I knew was ever a strength of mine that I wanted to measure and that I knew in the scope of things that I had to work on was really relevant information, you know, when I have so many areas to make improvements otherwise. Well, and then uh, what, what about the flip side of that? I mean, you see, you have a high VO2 max and you think, oh, I'd make an excellent endurance athlete or for whatever reason, you're a burgeoning endurance athlete. You head into the lab and you find out you have a exceptionally low VO2 max. I mean, do you yeah. just, you know, pack up your crap and, and go home. This isn't a sport for me because yeah, maybe it's good. I didn't know. 
for real. I mean, there are plenty of <laughs> high level endurance athletes out there who don't have exceptionally high VO two maxes, but they've developed their other capacities to, to the nth degree and they perform really well. It wasn't Cavendish's famously something like 52 or 55. Yeah. I mean, it, and that, those are relative numbers and he's mm -hmm. no offense, but his body weight fluctuates quite a lot. So you know, when they measured that, it's, uh, who knows? I'd like to see it, see it in that context. And there's also the tendency to then label those situations. Right? Oh, well, Cav's a sprinter, so it doesn't matter. Cav's mm. an incredible athlete. He's getting every, through sp Every sprinter tours. on the world tour like, has <laughs> a huge aerobic capacity. Oh, uh, yeah. It's not a huge aerobic capacity. They're operating at a high percentage of a pretty big aerobic capacity. Yeah. It, it seems like a good way to recap this chat is that in most, like, and, and Hannah, you, you did it perfectly here. Um, and perhaps what I'll do is I'll just skew more toward the VO2 max versus FTP th sort of thing. If you're training for the majority of athletes, if you're training and you're getting fitter and you're seeing that outcome in your power numbers, likely your VO2 is also going up like that. That's, that's likely the case, right, Chad? Um, and max, within yeah. reason, it's not going to be like, you know, you're, you aren't going to go in this linear path where it'll just continue to go upward. Um, but it's likely going up. Um, and these, and really, like we said, we don't know what the algorithms are that are uh, calculating uh, what your VO2 max is from a watch or anything like that. Um, but even if you were to test with a cart, you'll probably see that when you aren't training as much, it goes down. And when you train more, it goes up. But in the end, if you have power to show that, and then power is what you can guide every interval by, like Hannah said, that's much more relevant to a cyclist. So, um, yeah, yeah I, I appreciate I'm curious like curiosity too. so much. Like it's, yeah, same, you know, right? as, as we get into cycling and learn about what all of this means, like glad that Blake is curious about it, but I do want to advise that, um, you know, as you keep getting faster, like this is not the thing to focus on or the thing that's going to prevent you from getting faster or make you get faster. Like just keep training and focusing on nutrition and recovery and the things that are in the scope of your control, um, very directly, you know? Not to suggest and, that VO2 max isn't in the scope of your control to a degree, like Chad was kind of alluding to, but um, there are things that you can control that result more drastically in your improvement in cycling, right? That we should be focusing on. Man, and celebrate getting faster. I mm -hmm. hear so many people get so much faster and still try and discount it um, with some sort of caveat. And sometimes faster is just faster. I hear people all the time. I won the race. I had my highest powers number ever, but I didn't really feel that good. <laughs> it's okay. You were faster. <laughs> just celebrate being faster. <laughs> yeah. And Blake does this, right? Um, you're like, yeah, I raised my FTP like 50 Watts or something insane, but <laughs> my VO2 max is really <laughs> changing. Like not be stoked. You're getting faster. You're totally yeah, right. I don't, yeah. I don't even know what the benefit would be if we could have real time VO2 max feedback. I mean, we can have VO2 feedback. We can have sensors that tell us how much oxygen we're consuming in the moment, how accurate they are is a conversation for another time. One I don't want to be part of. But <laughs> if your VO2 max changes, it doesn't mean you are going to get faster. If your FTP changes, that pretty directly translates yeah. to you getting faster. Yeah. Uh, all of that said, I mirror Blake's curiosity because I'd really like to see what my VO2 max is with triathlon training and see if that, like you said, uh, you know, with me running and doing more running, uh, that like that typically is going to represent in, in higher VO2 max values. Like when you see an activity that requires more muscle recruitment, assuming that the athlete can actually utilize it effectively. Totally. But typically going to test higher. But what are you describing there? But, a, but a fun to know metric, it, it doesn't exactly have it. a ton of value. It's like me going to that arcade game and swinging the hammer down on the thing and seeing how high I can get it. Right. And that's like <laughs> it. And it means nothing else. Yeah. And it's just like a fun game. Um, just not swinging a hammer. Instead, it's really, really uncomfortable uh, for a while <laughs> doing a really hard ramp test. So, um, but Blake, I share your curiosity, but I advise the focus in the lines of what Hannah and Ivy have said. So, uh, okay. David's question. This one's great. Uh, it's for a hot takes episode perhaps. So we're just going to run it here. Um, so, uh, Ivy, he says, sag climbing is overrated for lower cat racers and caveat. This probably works way better for higher cat racers. Then David lays out the scenario. I'm a cat five novice racer with an endomorph build. And every time I've tried sag climbing at a race, I've been dropped almost immediately. 
I most recently tried sagging on the first day of a race and was predict and was predictably dropped. Sounds like you've got expectations already in place for this too, that are being fulfilled here. Um, so that's a, a red flag that I'm picking up on the next day. And, and also just with like, uh, I didn't, and perhaps you're just sharing this information, but identifying by our body type, like the ectomorph, endomorph, meso, all that stuff. Um, it's never done. I'm not sure it's done anybody any favors as well. Um, and particularly in cycling, um, you know, it can really, uh, be something where you, f it makes you feel like you don't belong or something and heck your performance and your effort. That's why you belong. So, um, Okay. The next day I hammered the climbs like everyone else, uh, classic yo, yo cat five, uh, David says, and ended the race with the bunch. I practiced climbing a good amount for a person my size at six foot, two inches and 216 pounds. And it turns out I can climb just fine without sagging. I first learned about sagging through trade and road podcast. So hopefully this provides enough spice to cover. Uh, the podcast is amazing and the hosts are all amazing and the platform rocks. Thanks. Ivy, what are your thoughts on this one? I, I, I kind of feel like maybe they're misunderstanding how to sag climb. I guarantee that David is misunderstanding how to sag climb. And that's not, that's totally understandable. It's hard to envision what it looks like to start near the front of a climb and kind of sift your way back. And in your mind, you think it's something like putting your hands on the tops it's really chilling, <laughs> like almost <laughs> coasting. And in your mind, you're like, yeah, I'll just chill out and just finish this climb at the end. In reality, you still <laughs> you have to pedal. As uh, hard as you and can so still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And so the difference between sag climbing and, and not um, really is more about positioning and gauging your effort than it is uh, about being chill and making the climb easier, if that makes sense. Um, it shouldn't change the scope of your effort too much. It should ju just change where you're positioned so that you're at, if you're at a deficit and if you want to try to conserve more, you're in an okay position at the end of that climb. Um, yeah. but I, I know you have a lot to say about this, John. Yeah. And, and actually, I mean, if you're relatively strong to the group, then maybe you can chill relatively speaking on the climb, right? Like if you're stronger than everybody, then you can roll to the front and let yourself fall back gracefully. But <laughs> I think that's what people have in mind right there. Exactly uh -huh. what you just described. Yeah. But in most, I don't know for, for at least in my situations, I am not relatively strong to the group. Like I'm either, you know, right in the thick of it or not as fast as the group. So when I'm sag climbing, I'm going to the front and I know that I'm going to climb just as hard as I would climb if I started the climb at the back. And, but my hope, my hope is that that effort that I have since I started at the front will leave me with the pack instead of dropped off the back of the pack, but the effort's the same. So mm -hmm. like, and we've seen this, you can look on our YouTube channel. We have videos where we've done like a local road race course that has a very steep, short climb in it. Um, that typically lasts somewhere between one and a half to two minutes for, for like the pack that's going up the, this climb. And you'll see Pete every time very cleverly rolling to the front and even getting a gap before we get to that climb. And then not gracefully whatsoever falling back to it. And in most cases, Pete would end up dropped after that climb about 20 to 30 seconds off. He went so hard on that climb every time uh, because that was just the nature of what he had to do against, you know, tiny bantamweight climbers that were flying up it. So it's yeah, all about was, like your relativity to the field, you know, and, and you have to keep that in mind. Yeah. And, and Pete used it, I think as a, a strategic method almost. He knew what was going to happen, but, and I guess this applies to him too, but if you're a rider who has to employ a sag climbing technique, then you know, every climb you're going to die a slow death. But if you put yourself at the front of the field and just start slipping back or rather just get swallowed up by people who are flying by you relatively, then it, it, I don't know, it gives you some sense of control. It's like, mm -hmm. well, I affected something. I at least got myself up to the front of the field and now I'm limiting my losses ever so slightly. I'm still going to end up off the back, but now I'm not going to be as far off the back because I took the reins and I made something out of nothing. Hannah, do you have to sag climb regularly in your racing career? I mean, you're typically at the front, like you're animating and you're doing all this stuff. So I don't know if that's the case. No, I... I don't sag climb very regularly. I have done it though um, in races where I don't feel good 
or Mm -hmm. maybe I'm coming off of illness or something like that. And again, just like you all are saying, it's not about being able to take it easy. It's about staying in the group. Um, And so when I have had to employ, employ that strategy, I'm not doing it because I'm trying to save matches for later in the race. I'm doing it to limit my losses. Um, Desperation so move. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I think if you're sag climbing, that's fine. It's totally fine. But you need to recognize that just like Chad just said, it's a desperation move. It's something you're doing to stay in the game. Um, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not the strategy employ that you employ to win. Um, and I think what we've all heard in this, in this question is the fact is the mindset that you're going into it with. And I think that at least for me, whether it's side climbing or just a race, if I go into it and I think it's going to be easy and then it's even a little bit hard, it is exponentially harder than if I just go into the race thinking this is going to be hard. Um, no one wants to go hard when they think it's going to be easy. So (laughs) I would, I would change the mindset, uh, a little bit. And then the other thing is, if all of this still isn't resonating with you, I would ask yourself how you're executing your ability to sag climb. If you are sprinting to the bottom of every climb in order to enter the climb in first position, that is also counterintuitive. Um, and you might not even be thinking that you're doing that, but really play it in your head. If you're coming up to climbs thinking, oh, better get to the front and then executing an attack or coming up the side or whatever it takes, that's energy that you could have spent on the climb instead. So all of this comes together. You can't think of a race as the flat section, the climb, the descent. They all bleed into each other. Yeah, this is, and when you're talking about David, relatively speaking, your intent was to communicate that you are of a larger build than the average cyclist that you're racing against. I believe that was the intent. And in those situations, the best riders that I've seen in those scenarios are ones that like Hannah said, aren't panicking to position themselves there. They're already understanding that like, all right, so for me to stay with the pack through here, I'll just have to make sure that I am in a spot where I am not cooked before climbs and I'm toward the front. So then my hardest effort going up the climb will still keep me with the pack. And that's just how they race. Um, and that it's, it's not that they're going easy. So it's just like the, the way that you kind of uh, address things proactively, I, I, I want to take some time to talk about other per, cause I'm now like this instantly caused alarm bell alarm bells, David. And I'm like, what other strategies have we talked about that we have not explained well and possibly are people doing incorrectly? I want to cover a few of them. I want to cover hard race starts and Hannah, I want to go to you and Ivy in particular on this one, but how do you know how hard is hard enough when you have, a cross country race, short track race, cyclocross race, these ones that, that stereotypically start out hard. How do you measure what hard enough is? Ooh, (laughs) I don't know actually (laughs) what (laughs) good Um, question. (laughs) Too good, John. (laughs) Okay. I I will just answer this the way that I feel. (laughs) Good, good. That's what Um, we want. I think, I think what's hard enough is a hundred percent contingent on the course. Um, so if it's in, if you're talking about a mountain bike race, if it's wide open, I'm not going to go that hard off the start. I am going to stay with the people that I think are a threat in the race. And that is it. Um, if it's single track or there's a critical feature coming up hard enough is whatever it takes to be in the right position going into that. Um, and so I think what hard enough is truly is contingent on what your goal is in the race and what it takes to achieve that goal. And so how hard I'm going to start is actually a really challenging question that I do ask myself before every single race. And the answer does vary greatly depending on the train, my expectations, my competitors, my goals. And I think it should for everybody else as well, because if your goal is purely time-based and there is no single track, you should start at the pace you want to hold the whole time. Um, But if your goal is to win the race and there's a single track 100 meters up the road, 
your pace might be 100% all out. You're almost falling over when you enter that single track and then everyone is stuck behind you for the next mile and a half. Yeah. Yeah. But I always th- feel like it's important to remember that if you feel like you're going to blow up after that, chances are the other people that you're competitive with are also going to blow up after that too. You know? So mm-hmm. Ivy, do you have any thoughts that you'd want to share on this one? Uh, just that I'm so glad Hannah said that so succinctly because my <laughs> head was spinning between all of the disciplines that I feel like I race and uh, trying to think about those start scenarios and what I actually think about, which is hard enough. And it, Hannah totally nailed it. It just depends too much upon what you're racing towards at the most immediate feature, how long the race is, who you're racing with. Um, like I'm at, if I'm at a smaller local cross race and um, I'll be racing for the win, you know, um, my start isn't going to be as hard as if I'm at a UCI race because, um, it depends upon who you're racing with. You know, there's no need for me to burn a bunch of matches and do this big effort in the start. If it means I could try to throw down more power later. Um, it totally depends on who you're racing with and what discipline you're racing and what the immediate feature is. Can you imagine, Chad, if we all started races based on who we were going to race with and we just competed with them? Wouldn't that be a dream? It's then like it wouldn't be like everybody just like, especially mountain bikers, just blowing their brains out on the start uh, (laughs) to get into the first turn. It's like and like there have been times when I've done that and I'm like, look, I'm going to finish back of the pack. Like, what am I doing right Mm -hmm. now? Like, I'm just group think. I'm just going along with all the lemmings here and we're all just, you know. And, and, toward our demise. <laughs> and that sounds totally counter to what both Ivy and Hannah are saying. And let me see if I'm getting this right. But you guys have a clear plan with each and every race start, how, how you're going to affect that start. So it's not just to line up and <laughs> kind of <laughs> go with the flow. You you know very clearly what you intend to do. Mm-hmm. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next one, pace lines. Uh, Chad, stopping from surging in pace lines is probably the most common way that I see pace lines done wrong. What have you done to control that for yourself or what do you recommend to others? Um, how to mean keep a pace line going well, surging into the forward spot. You mean coming from second position into first? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, the, the common problem that I see with pace lines is that people surge too much within a pace mm. line. Right. And, and they do that. Um, so yeah, what advice would you have? And then we'll go to Ivy on that too. <laughs> Over time, you can develop a feel for it, but initially data provides super good feedback. And whether you're getting getting power output, which is going to be different when you're in the draft and when you're in the wind, or miles per hour, which isn't going to be different when you're in the draft and in the wind, but will vary based on the terrain because, you know, what if now you're going uphill? <laughs> um, is it, so the, my point is you kind of got to rely on external feedback data. To, to, to help you with it. But over time, you gain a sense for what's this feel like? What's it feel like when I'm at the front? And you need verbal feedback also, or you can at least benefit from it from your teammates who tell you, you know, slower, softer, whatever it is when you pull through. Because because often enough, regardless of what data you have staring staring back at you on your, on your head unit, you may still not be getting it right. Mm-hmm. Ivy, uh, you, what thoughts do you have? I love this because I see this all the time where the reason I think people surge a lot um, to come around has to do also with the person that is coming off the front. Um, And one of the biggest mistakes I see in pace lines is once you are done with your effort and done pulling to kind of sustain that. Riders do not understand that your job is done and it is time to get get out and rest and recover. And I think my, my perspective might be a little dramatic from things like team time trials with four riders. When, uh, when you were done on the front, it is your responsibility to rush back, uh, to the, to the back and get back in line and recover as soon as you can. And that doesn't look like hitting your brakes or fully coasting. It just looks like really deliberately, reducing your effort so that you can get back and recover as soon as possible. And that's a mistake I see a ton of riders make. And it makes it harder for the person that's trying to come over the top of you when you are just sustaining your effort, even though you've pulled over and you've said that your job is done and flicked your elbow to just sustain like that, you're hurting the pace of the group. You're hurting the person that's trying to come around you and you're preventing yourself from being able to recover. 
So that's like, that's the yes. biggest uh, way in which I see people do pace lines incorrectly. It's not the pulling effort. It's when you are done that people mess up. And I wonder if part of that comes from the misunderstanding that once I'm off the front, I know how hard it is going to be going to be to get onto the back again. So I'm going to hang on to some of my speed until I need to get onto the back. Mm -hmm. I think there might be a little confusion there. And it's a, you, you could probably argue that there's a, a little value in not getting fully off the gas and slip into the back and trying to sprint back on, but rather staying on it just enough so that you don't have to work quite as hard to get onto that back position. And it takes I, I'd, being cognizant of how many people are in your group, right? If you're in a group of only four or five people or two or three in a breakaway, um, you know, Chad, that you have, you can't let off too much and fully coast because it's going to be completely. a split second before you're on the back again. But if in your yeah. group of 15 or 20, maybe do fully coast for a second, but then be mm -hmm. aware, okay, I've passed like eight or nine riders time to like slowly start picking it up so that by the time you get to the back, you don't have to do a huge acceleration to close this gap and be surprised when the back of the group is suddenly there. Yeah, exactly right. I have a good guideline for this that I follow. Uh, it's in between the time that I am on the front and going to the back or the distance that you could measure or how long our pace line is for the first half of the length of that pace line, I should be going very easy. And then for the second half, I just anticipate that I will be going a bit harder. Uh, there's nothing worse than being at the front of the pace line and looking over at a guy and be like, oh, so I guess that we're just riding side by side now. Like, <laughs> like get out of here. Like, yeah. get back. Yes. it's yeah. so frustrating. Um, <laughs> Because yes. it's completely denying it. And then also, whenever you go to the front and you surge, the best way, like Chad said, the, and the way that I found is not going by power. Eventually, you'll get RPE really dialed in, and you'll be able to just hold on to that feeling of how hard it feels. And that's very important. The What I've found much more helpful in a pace line situation before that becomes calibrated than power is to rely on speed. When you are the second wheel, Unless you're going through a terrain that's really changing in between you being second wheel and the third wheel, just maintain the speed like, and, and feel what that feels like. And what it'll feel like is suddenly your power will go up, but then after that it will stabilize and then it'll drop back down. If you're in a group of four, it should look like you are doing something that basically looks like you, if the front effort is an interval, then after that you'll drop back down and then it slowly, la and then it, it'll ladder back up. And like, it will constantly ladder back up. There'll be a little surge and you get back onto the back, but it'll be like ton of Bora, like that workout that you see where it just steps its way up minus the step down part. You'll just do like repeated little ramps. And that's what it really should look like. And, uh, if it's done properly with a group that's really working together well, sorry, Chad, you were going to say, no, no, I was just going to, the, the RPE that you mentioned, that's the feel that I'm talking about cultivating over time. Mm -hmm. And it can be as simple as I know I work. Uh, just how much harder do I work when I'm in the wind? I mean, a few rotations through a pace line, you'll get a sense of how much harder you have to work when you're in the wind. And, and that may not come immediately. I mean, you may be as, as experienced as can be, but it's going to take a few interchanges before you recognize I need to push this much harder or not as hard because I'm, you know, people are coming up on me or I'm, I'm tailing them off. But yes. shouldn't take long. I mean, and the more you do of them, the more quickly it comes with each new team time trial or pace line. It's pretty amazing, right? How like well calibrated our perception of effort can get. It can get really calibrated. Yeah. And you can just like, it's, you'll even notice, I'm sure you've noticed this. If you're using trainer road and you're following a plan consistently, you can even tell yourself like, I'm going to ride at like 250 Watts now. And then you look down and you're like, wow, I'm doing it. Or like, I'm going to ride at 200 Watts and you can just kind of figure it out. It's really cool. Um, okay. Next one is TT pacing. And I'm the worst person to answer this one. According yeah, to I'm not podcast pass. Lore. hard pass. <laughs> I'm not talking about this. Chad loves TTs. Uh, that's <laughs> one of the things Hannah, that you've Hannah, done you, very well. Do you too. have anything on this one? No, go for it. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, this is, this is most of the art in, in time trialing and maybe it's all of the art actually, but it's, I, I wish there was a hard, fast answer. There's, there's not, I mean, the shorter the time trial, the harder you have to go out, the more uncomfortable you're going to be earlier in the, in the, the, whatever the distance may be. Um, I, I, some of the, 
my best time trial experiences, my best performances, I should say, came when I softballed it. I mean, I went ridiculously easy to start off, so much so that I thought, this is this is ridiculous. This will come back and bite me. I'm, I'm, I'm hemorrhaging time right now. There's no way this strategy is going to pay off. But for whatever reason, I made myself abide that strategy. And I can't think of a time where it didn't pay off in both team time trials. And I think that's where I first learned the lesson and then individual time trials. It should, and not the whole lack of perception. I mean, look at your power, say 350 Watts feels easy. I know I can't do 350 Watts for more than a couple of minutes, but it feels easy. So I'm going with it. No, no, no. All that aside, it just has to be the, the numbers are telling you it's easy. Your perceptions telling it's telling you it's easy. Everything says this is easy right now and it's probably too easy. And I'm worried about how easy it is. That, yeah. That's, that's what's worked best for me. I, I've heard, I remember Wiggins, I think talking in his book, or maybe it was that film a year in yellow, um, that he would get out of the start hut and just get to whatever he figured his average speed would be. And he would do that as quick as he could. Then after that, he would put, put that to bed. Like he would, he would no longer think about a hard effort ever again. Mm -hmm. After that, it was just holding that, you know, holding that effort of what it took to then sustain that speed. Right. Um, but then I've also heard different, uh, reports where athletes say that, like, I don't worry about ramping up to get up to whatever pace or anything else that I want. I go out of the gate and I go intentionally easy as I roll down the ramp or as I start off from the gun, whatever it might be. Well, and I, One of the, I do think um, we should clarify right now what easy is. <clears throat> it's mm -hmm. very relative. It does not mean it feels good, but it, it mm -hmm. is, is noticeably easy because you know the pain that's coming and, and it's not that painful right away. If it is, that's, that's, that's when you got to, I mean, not literally put on the brakes, but definitely ease off the gas. One thing that I've found is that you, you probably will know how long the time trial is going to take you. And you'll probably have a good idea in terms of what sort of PR you currently have for that, especially if you're using trainer road, it pulls all that information for you. And you'll see what your 17 minute PR is. If that course is going to take 17 minutes, you'll know what that's like. Uh, one guideline. And I know that Nate likes to make me out to be a terrible pacer. I actually think I'm not too bad, um, at it. So, um, and one of the things that I have found a lot of help with is sure. I might go hard out of the gate really quick. My body is able to swallow and absorb those sort of anaerobic little spikes really easily. And that's not a big thing. So I might get out of the gate quickly and then settle into that pace. But for the first half of the race, I stick to the bottom end of my power target. And then the second half of the race, I let curiosity take over. And that doesn't mean that I'm going to be surging all over the place. My normalized power and my average power are still just tight. They're within a one to two Watts of each other at the end of it. Right. So it's still even pace throughout, but I feel like it's really helpful for those of us that have eyes bigger than our stomachs or bigger than our legs, as it were, it's easier, uh, to sometimes hold to that power target for the first half and then allow yourself to stretch thereafter. Like Chad's saying, um, it should feel like you are, okay, this is, this is absolutely sustainable and I'm leaving something on the table here. And that's yeah. likely going to be a faster way to finish your time trial. Having, having thought about it for a second here, it's basically a belabored description of negative splitting. I mean, that, that's yes. all you're doing. That's it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, two more sand and mud sections. Uh, this just this weekend, I'm thinking of Belgian waffle ride, uh, oh, Scottsdale yeah. and the finish, how they went into the sand. And that was like the difference maker between the crazy good racing between Chris Blevins and Keegan, just attacking each other nonstop for like the last like 15 miles. Chad, it was so cool. Um, Has this been covered yet? They, they like, or? they covered it just on their like Instagram stories. And while it was good coverage, that does, that's not sticky. It disappears. Um, mm -hmm. it'd be great if they actually found a, a good way to do it, but it was just like wild. It was like Keegan attacking with everything he had, then Chris counterattacking. And then mm. I think it was like, uh, Keegan did six attacks. Chris did five. Um, just all out brutal over rollers attacking each other sort of things, but they went into sand at the end. And Chris mentioned that whether it was line choice or something else, he bogged down and Keegan was able to carry momentum. And that was the last match, the straw that broke the camel's back. And Chris came on un unattached and, and Keegan was able to hold it to the line just at the end there. So, but Ivy, what do you, what do you do in sand sections? Because I see a lot of people just going to sand sections thinking they need to just, it's where you ride hard. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, drill it, right? And they just think more power or something is going to fix it. Yeah, <laughs> and carrying <laughs> too much speed into a Santa section can really backfire on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. But yeah, in answering the question of techniques that you can do incorrectly, for something like sand and mud, mud honestly, I think the way you can do it incorrectly is not practice it because it's... Uh, you know, like many of these other skills, something that is so circumstantial that's different in every scenario um, when you're thinking about the momentum that you can carry into a sand or a mud section. You know, if someone like Hannah who experiences like a really muddy section on a climb, you're not going to be able to carry a bunch of speed into it. And you need to think deliberately about your gear choice before you get there. And the same goes for sand and mud. Depending upon the run into that section will determine your how much momentum you want to carry into it, how much you should try to scrub, if any, the gear choice you select going into it, not to be shifting into once you're there and going, oh no. And, <laughs> um, and so that said, there's no like perfect power or gear to be picking for this um, or cadence or, um, yeah. Uh, what am I trying to say? It varies too much depending upon the length of the, of the section, the kind of sand and mud you're riding in, that varies too. You need to really practice this to understand how you best carry momentum and speed and feel comfortable so that you you know what to do when you get in that scenario. You know how, what gear to throw it in in relation to your speed and momentum before you get there. I've seen a lot of athletes like go through sand at wide ranges of cadence and still have success. And one thing, like if you go in with a higher cadence, it's easy to unweight your bike. And sometimes that can be bad. Sometimes it can actually be helpful. It depends. Um, and whereas if you go in with like a slower cadence, it can help you maintain more even torque and more momentum. But boy, if you get bogged down with a slow cadence then you just don't go anywhere. So, um, but the, the one thing that I've the just rabid power output thrashing, doing whatever you need to, to just put out more power and roosting sand all over the place. That doesn't seem to be what I see Ivy do. Uh, I'm thinking of Tobin Orton blood and like, you know, good cross or good cyclocross racers that I watch. It's like, you're really smooth and it's almost like you're prioritizing. Like you want to like surf it and stay smooth rather than just put out brute power. Is that accurate? What I'm seeing is that representing also what you're focused on? Totally. Uh, and when thinking about too high of a cadence, like you, you're just trying to maintain power as much as you can, as smoothly as you can for as long as you can. So that can, can look like having a higher cadence a little bit at first, but when you see that big, like rooster spray of sand, like sure, it looks Mm -hmm. cool, but that's not a good thing. That means that your (laughs) rear tire is slipping and you know, you're, you're just burning power. You're just wasting energy in that circumstance. Um, so you're right Mm -hmm. that when you see riders, look really smooth. It's, it's very intentional and it's done to maximize the use of your power. Mm. Uh, what, what about you, Hannah with, uh, I know you've done cyclocross, but then also some of the cross country races you did last year in the mud was just absurd. Um, what sort of recommendations or, or what common things do you see done incorrectly with mud in particular? Ooh. Um, I think a lot of riding in mud has to do with how you're weighting your tires. And so a lot of that comes again, like Ivy said, from experience and understanding exactly what side, what type of weight you need on that tire in order for it to gain traction, um, too little. And it's just going to spin out too much and you're going to be torquing it so hard that it's again, spinning out. And so actually, um, like we're talking about here in really muddy races, especially if it's a climb, it's usually not super high power. A lot of the time it's a very finessed effort. Um, and I find that usually that can be one of the hardest parts of mud racing is in a race, you have so much adrenaline, so much motivation that you just want to absolutely throttle it. But in mm-hmm. mud racing, a lot of it is holding back. It is going 90%, not a hundred because it, it just involves so much finesse. Hmm. Oh, like the opposite of what we think. We just want to power through, but restraint is better. Last one I want to talk about is sprinting. Ivy, what common mistakes do you see with sprints? And then we'll go to Chad after that. But 
I, I guess there's like the, the positioning side, but then also the timing side, I feel like are two really big things. Um, but what, what do you see? Being over geared, um, mm. and starting your by sp- over geared, uh, like beginning your sprint in the hardest gear that you have, because you might <laughs> finally work up to sustaining a good cadence in that gear, but it takes you such a long time to get on top of the gear that by the time you get there and you're comfortable sprinting speed and cadence, the race is already gone and everyone's come around you. Um, so I think there's a common misconception about sprinting that because you, it's, it's a explosive, powerful effort that it should begin that way and in that way. And in reality, the best sprinters, um, begin their sprint in not their hardest gear at a pretty high cadence. And they work down to that really high speed, hard gear sprinting. Uh, Chad, what, what other common mistakes do you see with sprints? I think it's <clears throat> what Ivy was going to say, and she was going to take both of mine because overgearing was the first thing I was going <laughs> to say. And you really only make that mistake once because it's it's humbling and it's informative. Hopefully, <laughs> yeah, you hope. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but the other one is starting your sprint too early. Uh, it, it's so easy to get anxious and and just if, if there's any sort of ebb in the field, any any hole opens up that you want real bad. I mean, there's so many things that can steer you or prompt you to begin your sprint even just slightly too early. I mean, no, no, sorry if this is a spoiler, but watch Gaviria this morning at Torino Adriatico. It's And this is a guy who's used to going long because going long works for him, but you go a little too long and you know, it doesn't work. So this timing, is, I, obviously. I feel like the most common misunderstanding, perhaps not a mistake, although it leads to a mistake, is that uh, you come into a sprint and you're relatively fresh and you're ready to just explode when this, when the sprint starts. Whereas if you look at the power and you look at the speed and everything else of a person that's going to win a race and is doing so in a sprint, it's hard leading up to a sprint. And it's to, it's like very hard because you're having to get yourself in the right position for that. And so I think that there's a misnomer that you should be fresh and ready to go and that you should thusly keep all powder dry leading into a sprint. I've never once uh, had the fortune of being so fast that I could do that <laughs> in relation to a field. It's the opposite. I have to really push hard. And when I start my sprint, in most cases, I am not thinking that I am in an ideal position to sprint or I'm in an ideal state. Like I'm, I'm exhausted. Um, but then you're able to launch on top of that. You're able to have a little bit of something in reserve and you're able to make it happen. Um, the other thing too, Chad, leaving it too late, that's quite common for a lot of folks too. You, Mm -hmm. and it possibly it's along the same lines of like needing to keep the powder dry. So you're just staying behind that person, staying behind that person when really you should get out. Right. And that's arguably maybe the most dangerous strategy too, because people take bigger risks when there's, as the clock ticks down, as they get closer, you know, hundred meters, 50 meters, 20 meters, it gets increasingly desperate. So if you haven't figured out your strategy prior to that, and you're making very last second decisions, uh, you do so probably at a higher level of risk than you'd otherwise entertain. Yeah. Um, Hannah, uh, in gravel racing, there's not many sprints, however, they do happen. And then in mountain bike racing, there's more, but do you have any thoughts on like common mistakes that with sprinting technique? Oh, I mean, I think these two really covered it from the pure sprinting standpoint. I think, um, from a mountain biking, uh, specific outlook, you really need to look at the course prior to the race. If you think that there's any chance that it'll come down to a sprint and there's always a chance. So (laughs) always look, (laughs) um, but it, it just varies so much in, in mountain biking. Sometimes the final sprint is actually to the final corner. Um, sometimes it is to the finish line, but sometimes it's to the last single track and it, it can be difficult to make those, those decisions prior to the race. But I think it's important to have a plan because just like we're talking about going too early or going too late, it's really extra hard to make those decisions when you're already tired and seeing double. Um, so whatever plan you make ahead of time is probably at least the smartest plan you're going to get to on that day. Yeah. With cadence to give people a good tip on that, because I'm thinking of like short finishes, sorry, uh, I'll drop the cadence thing for a bit, but short, like finish line straights, 
sometimes you want to be the first person into that corner. If it's like a hundred meters to the line, something like that, like you want to make sure that you are the first one through that turn or else you're going to have to try to make a pass when somebody's already sprinting at speed that you wouldn't be able to come around. Um, with cadence, it's way faster than most people think. And it's really helpful to go out and do sprint workouts with somebody that's a good sprinter and then look at your numbers thereafter. It's not, uncommon at all for you to start your sprint above a hundred RPM and then to sprint into 120 even higher than that. Uh, you'll see like we kind of misunderstand that force is power and that that's going to make us go fast. So we just think like big force into the pedals, like pulling on my bars hard, pushing on my pedals hard. And that's not it. That's not how you generate speed very effectively. Um, and so, you know, we need to be in that right spot and it's almost always faster than you think. Uh, so getting really good at that, at being able to control the sprint at a high leg speed is also very important because in most cases, even in your sprint practice, the race goes way faster than your sprint practice. You might find yourself running out of gears real quick and having to sprint on what feels like a granny gear. So <laughs> yeah. I think the, the lesson in all this is we need to be practicing all this stuff regularly. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're a bike racer, like it's the cool part is all this stuff is fun to practice too. Like pace lines, even it's a blast to practice that sort of thing. Time trial is not so sure if it's the yeah. funnest thing to practice, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, that's what I'm doing triathlon, right? Um, yeah. So, uh, okay. With that, thanks everybody. Hannah, thanks for joining us. As Congrats, good Hannah. Me. Crushing it. Yeah. You too. What's, what's your next race? Um, the U S cup at Vail Lake. Okay, cool. The one down in uh, California, Southern California. Mm -hmm. And then when's your first, when's the first lifetime Grand Prix this year? Sea Otter. Sea, oh yeah, of course. Sea Otter. So that'll be exciting. You did pretty well at that one. Is there, no, you crashed at that one last year. Is that right? Yeah, I crashed. I was doing really well and then yes. I crashed. So time for some redemption. Mm, I'm excited for it. It'll be good. So uh, if you're listening to this, it's a huge favor and it's what keeps our podcast going. If you rate this podcast on any podcast app. If the more ratings that come in consistently, like for example, if this week, all of you rate it and we get a bunch of that, that's going to make Spotify, iTunes, whatever other podcast app you, you use, that's going to make our podcast pop up in recommendations more readily when people are searching for cycling podcasts. The more people that find this podcast, the more people sign up for trainer road, the more great things we can build like AI FTP detection, adaptive training, get out this amazing new tool that we're building. Of course, we've called it workout levels V2, not sure what we'll actually call it out in the open, but that analyzes all of your rides and gives you the credit for it. Super cool. We'll be able to build more of that the more you rate and share this podcast. So if you can do that, that would be huge. Super big thanks from us. And if you're watching on YouTube, give this a thumbs up, comment, let us know what you enjoyed and what you want us to talk about. Submit questions at trainerroad.com slash podcast and we'll talk to you next week. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.